All right, so hello again to everybody. Uh, my name is Kwame Kwame Fojo. I come uh, from Ghana and also Australia for, for a very long time. I used to live in Australia, live and teach in Australia at a university called Monash University and before that a number of other universities in Australia and New Zealand and briefly I also taught at the University of Papua New Guinea. Now my mentioning these things is not to show off but to actually indicate that I have been for a very long time possibly 20 years or so much it's probably even more than that in a different part of the world whilst still continuing to engage with the African continent. Now the importance of that part of the, there are two ways in which that part of the world is important to us in Africa. First of all, in a, in a very, in a relatively small, um, highly developed country called New Zealand, they put together an approach to fisheries management called the quota management system. Now I happen to be in New Zealand at the time of the, the quota management system of the QMS was being put into place. It is quite a revolutionary approach to managing fisheries. It has quite a bit of relevance to the African context. And I was privileged to be there at a time when it was being put together. Hopefully it will be possible to explain the relevance of New Zealand in some more detail as we go along. Whilst you're listening to me, can you please be looking at the map? If it's possible, Bernard, is, if it's, is it possible to blow up in any larger way? Or can, can people um, increase the size on their screens in any way at all? Or it's fixed from Bern, Bernard's end? Okay, all right. Okay, let me talk a little bit more about myself. So New Zealand, I was there at a very important stage when something called the QMS was being put into place. Now, Australia and is important because whilst I was living and teaching in Australia, I was also doing quite a lot of consulting work for a group of small island states. Those of you who follow rugby would know one of them, an island called Fiji. There's also an island called the Solomon Islands. There's one called Kiribati, Kiribati uh, Federated States of Micronesia, Marshall Islands, uh, Palau, and so on. They, they are called the Foreign Fisheries Agency Group of Countries and the parties to the Nauru Agreement Group of Countries. Now, those countries are very important to us in Africa in terms of trying to find a way forward to get maximum benefits from our fisheries. Now, I was fortunate also to be in, well, I was during the time that I was in Australia and New Zealand, as I said, I did a lot of consulting work. And I was also present at a time when those Pacific Island states were grouping themselves together to put into place arrangements which would ensure that in their relationships with foreign fleets, they got maximum and ever increasing benefits to themselves. So what I bring to the game in terms of the discussion that I'm having with you today is to introduce some new ideas and some new ways of thinking about how across the continent and in all our coastal states, we can improve the financial returns that we get from our arrangements with the foreign distant water fishing fleets and also, um, I guess, point the way forward to reorganizing our frameworks. Now, I guess in terms of some further detail about myself, uh, I currently work for the African Union as a, fisheries, as a fisheries governance advisor. And part of what I do is to try and introduce some of these new ideas to the people who, the directors of fisheries and the ministers of fisheries, the people who manage our fisheries in both our national interests and the collective interests of the continent. Um, I'm an international lawyer by profession, but I'm basically, I don't go to court. What I do is I do international law 
practice as well as appear in international tribunals. I was during the period from 2015 to 2018, I was national coordinator for the government of Ghana in its efforts to negotiate and then arbitrate a dispute between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire on the maritime boundary delimitation process. We went to court against Cote d'Ivoire before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. I was manager within the Ghana context of a 76 person team, which basically put together the case for Ghana. I'm pleased to say that we won. We won and we saved for Ghana around 60 billion US dollars worth of resources. We paid the lawyers $9 million. So you can see that if you're a hotshot international lawyer, which I'm not, sadly, you can make a lot of money. But anyway, we won against Cote d'Ivoire. It was not a fight, really. We're now very good friends. There was a small period when our relations were not very good, but we now cooperate very seriously with each other. In short, I have a fairly uh, deep and rounded profile in matters to do with law of the sea, uh, fisheries, petroleum, etc. So that is the framework or the background from which I'm, I guess, coming to you today. That should all this talk about myself, hopefully, has given Bernard enough time to, to be able to organize some of the extra information that I've sent to him. All right, now this chart in front of us, this chart in front of us is important because it shows you something which I describe as the global marine, aquatic and aquacultural products complex, GMAAPC. And I've sent you a fantastically detailed document on that. So there's all sorts of questions. There's all sorts of issues that you can read up further on and you can ask me questions. Now, for those of you who speak French, I think it might even be possible uh, in a week or so to get you a translation of that document. It will be probably through Google Translate, but it will still give you uh, some idea. It will give you some idea of material the material if your english is not that good as far as reading is concerned but hopefully for the time being if you're a francophone or you come from equatorial guinea or angola guinea bissau cape verde cabo verde uh sao tome the places that use portuguese i hope that you can still follow me in my in the english but you will get stuff that you can study at your leisure in the language of your choice um, at some point fairly soon. So, uh, whitefish, pod, pollock, I'm reading the map now. You can see that the arrows, are you all following me? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. You can all hear me? Yes, sir. Can we can hear you, sir. Yes, we are and hearing you. Can see the you can see the map. Yes, sir. We can yes. see the map. Very we good. We can see the map. Yes. Now, this map, if you we talk about Africa and all, all the talk that you've, you've uh, had so far about Africa and the blue economy has not talked about the global supply chains that we actually provide we actually provide inputs into global supply chains you can see that from the map we actually do not provide that much would you agree that we don't provide that much yes, sir. yes or no yes aha uh -huh. But even if we do not provide that much, it is still important and it's still very valuable. And now you see that a lot of the arrows are converging on which country? China, 
Yes, do you agree? China. China. Yeah. And you see that quite a few of the arrows are also converging. The purple arrow is converging on Europe. Yes? The one at the top. Yes, yeah. And then you can also see that there are a lot of flows out of China to the rest of the world. Do you agree? Yes, that's that's, that's that's correct. And then you will also see that there are there's a very large blue arrow going from Putin's Russia. Pardon mm -hmm. me. A very large Continue. arrow going from Putin's Russia. Putin, who is shaking the world at the moment and making everybody frightened, going from Putin's Russia to China. And that's because a lot of white fish is processed in China. That's correct. You can also see that there's a lot of white fish which moves from the United States on the left-hand side of the map and it goes again to China. Yes? You can see there's all yeah. these flows. Yeah? Okay. So we're talking about a global marine system in which Africa's place in this system is Africa place a pretty a very important place as far as the production of tuna. As far as the production of tuna is concerned. And also, Africa provides a very important contribution in the area of illegal fishing by Chinese fleets. Illegal fishing by Chinese fleets. Has everybody heard about this issue? Yes? Yes. Yes, I need some feedback from you as I go along. So illegal fishing by Chinese fleets, yes? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, all right. So let, let me let me let me give some idea of the economics of this. Now you see white fish. Yes, you're gonna have every single document available to you. Somebody's asking a question. My issue is that I have too many documents. If I get going, I'll even overwhelm you. So don't don't be afraid at all. You have more than enough to read in French, English, and if there are people who want it in Portuguese, I'll translate and send it to you in Portuguese as well. So for the time being, uh, listen, listen and try and, and follow the diagram and try and follow the arrows, yeah? Okay, so white fish. Now, white fish is exactly what it is called. It is fish that is white. And the beauty of white fish is that every single one of those things that you see itemized there, every one of those things that you see itemized there, cod, pollock, halibut, tilapia, carp, catfish, they are all substitutable for each other. Right? If they have been processed, you cannot tell whether it is cod, whether it is halibut, whether it is tilapia, whether it is Nile perch, whether it is catfish, you cannot tell. So once it is in a can or it is in some kind of container like plastic container and it has been cooked and boiled and you have put on top of it tomato sauce or oil or uh, vinegar or any of these preparations and nowadays when you go into any store you see all these fancy preparations of fish once they put the sauce on it you cannot tell what type of fish it is what type of white fish it is and where it is coming from now this is very important for explaining the chinese iuu in africa because what the chinese fleets do is that they come with these very big trawlers and they basically trawl everything in the ocean where they are in Ghana, Sierra Leone, wherever. 
and they catch everything in one big, ugly, big, large, lumpy mass of fish. Okay? If you can think of anything that is very ugly and very messy with everything inside, dead inside the net, it is a Chinese trawler net. I presume that everybody on the course knows what a trawler does. It trawls, it's literally drags along the seabed or drags through the water. Now, when you catch everything and it is a mess, you can send it back to China and it is used as a substitute or as an addition. So you actually have a packet of a, a packet of highly processed fish, which is exported along the lines that you see there from China. But inside that fish pack, are you all following me? No, we do. Yeah, yes, we are following you. Inside that fish pack will be a little bit of cod a little bit of halibut, a little bit of pol polak, and then the rest will just be messy white fish from Ghana, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Mauritania. You're following me now? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Yeah? Yes. And what is happening as a consequence of the Chinese IEU, as you know, is that when our fishermen go to try and fish for things, they don't get any fish in the sea. They may be going to fish in the sea looking for sardine or tuna, but the, the Chinese vessel may have actually trawled everything away. You're following me. And then, and then those of our people in our various countries who are foreign exchange, they basically import those, that, those fish products from China and sell it in our shops. In the meantime, that fish has been taken away from our fishing fleets. You get the logic of it? Yes, 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 and, sir. And one of oh, the ways yeah. in which sure, sure. you are following me. Mm -hmm. Yes. And one of the ways in which the Chinese government facilitates this activity by Chinese fishing companies is through subsidizing the fuel. So all those lines that you see there, which is trade in seafood products, if it comes from China, the fuel is subsidized. The vessel which takes the canned product and brings it to Ghana, takes it to Europe, it is subsidized. The fuel is subsidized. We know that in all our countries, because of the war between Russia and Ukraine, petrol has gone up. We want our governments come in. We want, um, this, I'm in a hotel room, so forgive me. Now, so we want our government to subsidize the fuel prices and bring fuel prices down in China. The fuel is subsidized to take the fish out, but also to bring the fishing vessels to come and fish off our shores. Yes, you get the logic? Okay, so this is what's called the Global Marine Aquatic and Aquacultural Products Complex. I've talked about white fish and substitutability. Let me move on now to talk about salmon. Now, salmon is the other, is another, it's pretty close to white fish, but it is different. Salmon has a distinctive taste and a distinctive smell, and there's not much substitution that takes place. So there's salmon that is caught in the wild, and there's salmon that is generated by aquaculture, right? You can, you can't really, I mean, someone, it's hard. It's hard to mix it with other things, right? So IUU is there, but it's not that strong. Tuna is the next one. Now, tuna is very, very important culturally to Europe and to Japan in particular. For those of you who are Catholics, for those of you who are Catholics, you know that during Lent, around Easter time, I think it is, you're not supposed to eat meat but you can eat fish. Because of Lent, fish is eaten in the Catholic countries of Portugal, Spain, France, and parts of Germany. Tuna, tuna is the particular fish of preference. Fresh tuna and canned tuna. And in the document that will be distributed to you, there's a total description of the global tuna 
products complex because I happen to be one of the world's experts on this particular aspect of what I call the global marine aquatic and aquacultural products complex. And as I indicated, you are seeing the total map of what it looks like in terms of trade within the GMAAPC. Okay, so tuna is very important also because apart from canned tuna, you, you, the Japanese use tuna in, in their sashimi and their sushi. The raw tuna is very highly valued in Japan. Bluefin tuna is the most highly valued. A very large bluefin tuna can actually, if you are lucky as a Japanese fishing vessel captain, it can actually pay, if you get three or four big catches, you can pay off your entire vessel because bluefin tuna is particularly highly valued for sashimi and sushi. Now I'll stop here. Um, are you confused? Because I'm not talking about sustainability, am I? I'm waiting. Thank you very much. Really, you have talked to something which is, for me, I'm, I'm familiar. What's that? Aware that? Something that I'm really uh, familiar because I started in real science. I know all these things which is happening in, in, in the coasts of Africa, especially uh, the, what, the, what the Chinese fleets are doing in the coasts. And also, and they, sometimes they are even uh, close to the, to, the, to, the, to the shores. Very, uh, very close to the shore. Yeah, yeah, very close to the shores, and they are doing some unimaginable thing. I can, I can, I can point out unimaginable thing and something that that you will just if you think about it, you will just be in headache. So okay. this need this. Uh, let, let, need let me this. let me explain. Let me explain one one of the reasons why sometimes they are actually doing some very targeted fishing because you see once upon a time when there was the Soviet Union, right? The Soviet Union hmm. used to be a major fishing power. And at that time, the law, the law of the sea allowed you to come very, because the law of the sea only had two zones. The three or nine nautical mile zone, which belonged to the coastal state. And from nine nautical miles onwards, it was high seas, okay? Now at the moment, we have the territorial sea, which is 12 nautical miles and the exclusive economic zone, which goes out to 200 nautical miles. You're all aware of this, are you? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Now, during the time that the Soviet Union yes. fishing fleets were dominating the world, they used to come up to the nine nautical mile limit and they used to map everything that was there, the movement of the fish and all that. Are you following me? <laughs> and sometimes they also yes. used to map things intensively because they would actually also put bombs and mines and all sorts of things on the seabed. This is not mm. important today because there might be a war between NATO and Russia. You following me? Mm. However, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Chinese went and got the map. Are you with me now? Do you understand this now? Yeah. Yeah. The Chinese went and got the maps from the Russians. And as an expert, even me, as an expert on Soviet fishing fleets, I have some of those maps because when the Soviet Union collapsed, those maps were just around the place. The CIA also went and collected lots and lots of those maps. This is part of the reason that the Chinese are all over the place because they are using old but very reliable Soviet maps. Yes? I see. Uh -huh. Yes. History is good. History is very good. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, you can see I'm having, I'm having a lot of fun. Yeah, sure. It's very no, interactive, sir. Uh, please, sir, uh, I need okay, a, a, little, a, little more, a little clarification on why African researchers and other critical stakeholders have not seen opportunity that the Chinese have undertaken and um, Fast run us uh, that we are in this kind of scenario. Mm. 
Yes, well, I have given you, or you will get a very, very highly detailed document which addresses all these issues. But let me just say, let me just, since you are from Nigeria, are you not? Hello? Oh, pro yes, sir. I'm getting you. Are you from Nigeria? Yes, sir, I am. Okay, very good. Let's do something on Nigeria and the GMAPC because you have a very, very interesting place in GMAPC. Which part of Nigeria are you from? I'm from Crossover State. Uh, in fact, the trigger of Africa. That is the Excellent. coast. Excellent. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, I have some idea of where you come from. So, you actually have a quite complicated network of rivers, the deltas, and so on. Yes? Yes. Yes, yes. And all that. Now, the role that Nigeria plays in the global system and has played for a very long time is that you're one of the major, uh, because of your very large population, you're one of the major places which consumed imported canned products, especially <clears throat> and also smoked products, smoked products from Norway, Sweden. And of course, you have nowadays your own local catfish. Am I going too fast? No, what's it for? All right. We are with. So they catch a mackerel from Senegal, Mauritania, and then they bring it to sell in Nigeria. And if you are Nigerian, you know about the Ibru, the Ibru brothers, who are very, very rich family. They actually started off before they branched out into other aspects of Nigeria. Ibru, I B R U. They yes, were the I first people, and you know about them, don't you? We, I do, sir. Yes. Ibru actually started as the main importers of mackerel into Nigeria. So you hmm. can see how they got the, their start with their millions of naira. Every time you were eating mackerel, you were giving money to Ibru. Okay. <laughs> now I've taken this approach deliberately because to understand the ocean industries, to understand the ocean industries, you need to see Africa as a place where the marine resources of the ocean provide raw materials into a total global supply chain system. And if we come back to the GMA APC, Let's now just, let's come back to our chart again. So white fish, what does Africa provide? Africa provides from Nigeria, catfish, catfish. We don't have Pollock, we don't have halibut. We also provide Nile perch from East and Southern Africa. And we also provide tilapia. Do you understand the logic now? Yes, sir, I do. We don't provide, we are not participants in the part of the GMAAPC concerned with salmon. We don't have salmon, so we are out, okay? We provide tuna. We provide uh, tuna for canning around the world. And then we provide uh, high quality tuna to be used in the sashimi and so on. Now let's come to the, pel the small pelagics. The small pelagics, the small school large, large schools of small fish, sardines. Here, a lot of the sardines of our shores go to Europe, it goes to Portugal and Spain, and it's also canned in Morocco, and then it is sold particularly in West Africa. In East Africa, you don't really eat the sardine that much. I travel all across, I travel all across the continent, and what I do in supermarkets is looking at the seafood products on the shelves. Okay, crustaceans, which is, which is shrimps, right? Again, here, Africa produces high-quality shrimps from Mozambique, from Cameroon, from Mauritania, and these are caught and exported. They are caught by local fleets who then bring them to shore, and then they are exported. They are exported in containers, particularly in the case of Africa to Europe. Then mollusks. That's uh, oysters, mussels. Here, here, Africa actually doesn't really produce. Mauritania produces a lot, but probably Mauritania is the only place 
where there is serious production from the African uh, from the African shores into the global network, uh, the global production and consumption network for cephalopods. But here, Ch Chinese, Japanese, Taiwanese, and Korean fleets are constantly looking around the world under access agreements to get access to uh, oysters and mussels because they eat them a lot in their countries. Okay, fish meal and fish oil. This is the last one. Now, this is very important. It is important for aquaculture because aquaculture to a large extent, fish are fed large, the larger fish, the tilapia, you give them fish, fish meal and other things to eat. And most of the fish meal is caught of Chile. You can see that large blue arrow going to China. It is caught of Chile, right? Anchovies caught of Chile in Latin America, South America, and then it is ground into fish meal and fish oil, and it is sent to China, and from there it goes around the world. Okay? Now, how many of you are working in the fisheries departments? Are there any of you who are working in fisheries departments? I want some quick answers. Is anybody here who's working in a fisheries department? Fishes, fishes, agriculture. All right, somebody's asked me, are people not aware? The answer is that our fisheries people are not aware. This learning that I'm bringing to you is not taught to people in biology. Am I right? A lot of our fisheries people are biology people. And when they negotiate the agreement, they don't bother to find out who they are negotiating with. Yes? Are you with me? Well, with you, sir. That's true. Because it is this information which we also need to help us choose whom we'll negotiate with, how much money we'll ask them for, and so on. Now, time is going, and therefore, and I think you are following the approach that I'm using. I don't really need to use PowerPoint. So let me just go on to the really important thing of the, the question of access agreements, because I've explained the GMA PC quite thoroughly, I think, and I think you understand. Now, basically, uh, okay, actually, let, let me just say one quick point about GMA PC and the relationship between aquaculture and marine capture fisheries. Now, the relation between aquaculture and marine capture fisheries it's very complex and it's very important if you're trying to organize either as a company or you're in charge of a government fisheries department and all that kind of stuff. Because for some of the, for some of the chains within the global marine aquatic and aquacultural products complex GMA APC that we had just described, aquacultural products are very, very important products for marine capture fisheries products. And because marine capture fisheries products, uh, I need the screen, please. Because marine capture fisheries products are going down in volume because of overfishing and IEU, aquaculture is coming in to replace the gap, either in consumption of fresh products, uh, tuna can be cultured to some degree, tilapia and so on, or as mass substitutes in the production. Oh, beautiful. I've got my, my outline here. I'll just, uh, let me just stop here and let, let me just give you some idea what I'm supposed to be uh, in a structured way talking about. I'm a very unstructured teacher, so I always have to have very, 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 very structured, detailed notes. Otherwise, students will, students will get lost or students get annoyed with me. That, hey, what was Kwame saying? Instead of teaching us about fish, he was talking about pudding. So the way that my system works is I give very, very detailed notes and I can fly around the world talking about anything and everything. But when you come back to study, when you come back to read, everything is there and you can ignore the fact that I was talking about Putin. Actually, let me just say one thing about Putin. Now, the Soviet, one of the reasons why Putin has in, invaded the, the Ukraine is because under the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union had a, had a coastline 
trawlers. Somebody is asking how does it how does it damage the ecology? Trawlers actually scrape the bottom of the seabed, or if it is a, a, a bottom trawler, it scrapes everything. It takes everything above what's called the mersal fish, fish which go up and down the water column are caught by trawlers. They are caught in place by trawlers. So the bottom seabed itself gets trawled. This is why it's an, actually, there's something, um, yeah, you can see there's so much, there's so much to teach. But are you following me, the gentleman who asked the question about the trawlers? Am I making sense now? Hello, is it Hassan? Yes, but uh, I just want to ask you how uh, does uh, this trowel damage the ecology especially? I've just explained the this. Hey, and, and it the damages fish. the bottom of the seabed and it takes everything in the water column without discrimination. Uh, okay. Large Good. fish, uh, growing fish. Uh, yeah, you get it. Yes, yes, good. Uh huh. Okay. Now, um, yeah, okay, next one. Oh, we don't necessarily have to. Uh, we don't necessarily have to replace trawlers. There are more sustainable ways of doing it. Okay, please, let, let me just walk through the, the large document so that you understand it. And then I can do what bits and pieces that you can ask me some more questions. And then unfortunately, the session will be over. What you should do is you should demand from the people who run this thing that you should give me, you should give me, you know, a whole two weeks in which you teach you all this, all this stuff. Yeah. Okay, so please come back to Bennett, come back to the first page and let me explain what I'm supposed to be doing. All right. So what I decided to do in this discussion was to provide you with a framework for understanding the GMA PC and its component parts. Okay. So the objective of the lecture, what are we trying to understand? We're trying to understand global value chains or global production networks to do with marine products generated in Africa by foreign fleets and how they contribute to the, to the global economy to our detriment. The key concepts discussed are the GMA APC, which I think I've successfully managed to explain. And then there's a second concept, which I'll have to get Bernard, or I think the Ms. Shandoff to help me out with in a minute with some diagrams from the larger document. The second, thing that I need to explain is what is called the fish production site. The third thing that I need to explain is a large marine ecosystem. And the final thing is the access agreement, which I've explained it in great detail in the document you have, because it was originally a study on access agreements. So I don't need to go into access agreements in too much detail. All right, now there are five countries whose fleets dominate global fishing. A uh, document which Bernard should have put up uh, on the website is a recent report by an American NGO called Stimson, the Stimson report. It basically says that 90% of fish caught around the world is caught by fleets from five countries, EU, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, and China, and the United States is in there catching tuna. So really, when we are talking about the interests of the developing world, versus those of the distant water fishing states. We are talking about the rest of the world versus EU, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, and China. And they gain access to what I call a fisheries production site. Bernard, are you there? Mr. Bernard. Yes, Mr. Mr. Fudjo. Yeah, okay. What I'm going to get you to try, okay, let, let me just walk through this very quickly. So basically, it's a very detailed document. It's about, I don't know, 90 something pages. It explains everything in detail. Um, you can all, you can just run through. Let me just do, see whether we can try and do the fishes production site concept because it's actually extremely, extremely important. Because once you understand the FPS, then you understand why countries enter into access agreements or why countries give licenses for fleets to come into the EEZ. Basically, a fisheries production site is a part of the EEZ or the high seas where the different kinds of fish that you want are very rich. It is a site where when you go to, you use your fishing gear to catch. 
but like, but when you actually catch fish at sea, you're actually producing fish, aren't you? You understand the concept of the production, production of fish. Marine capture fisheries uses fishing gear, which is a type of industrial technology to catch fish in those parts of the sea where the fish is very rich. And to be able to get to those parts of the sea where the fish is very rich, you You can detect the fish through using sonar. So sonar is a kind of technology which goes up and down and it tells you the size of the school of the fish, where the fish are going, sometimes how many fish there are. There are all sorts of detection devices. So you use detection devices to detect fish and you use fishing gear to catch fish, right? This is basic economics 101. So your capital input is the fishing gear and the, tech, the detection devices, these are capital goods. If you don't have capital or money, or if you only have small capital or small money, then your fishing equipment or gear or your fishing vessel will not be very large and will not be very strong, etc. Are you with me? Am I going too fast? Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. I, 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 is the pace okay or I'm going too fast? If the case is fine. Okay. Pardon me, am I going too fast? Sir, it's good. Okay, all right. Because you can see, you can, it's all explained in detail. You can read to catch up. Okay. Now, so fishing and fishing gear and fish detection devices are the major elements that you put into the process of producing fish by catching the fish. And then of course the vessel is the, so fishing vessel, fishing gear, fishing vessels are different types, fishing gears of different types and fish detection devices. These are the three things that you combine as capital inputs to produce stuff in a fish, in a marine fishery, okay? So tuna, sardine, uh, cephalopod, octopus, all these have their specialized fishing gear, specialized vessels, and specialized detection devices. Now tuna in particular is very interesting because it is what is called a highly migratory species. It moves around the ocean. So when the European fleets are trying Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, Bernard. Bernard, if you are there, can you can you please phone me? Can you please phone me on my phone? Okay. Bernard. All right, sir. Yes, please phone me because I can't get out to you. All right, so I was going on. So the fish production site concept is really important because when when Ghana licenses a foreign fleet to come and fish in the EZ, we give them a license, or Senegal enters into a fisheries agreement, or Comoros enters into a fisheries agreement, or Madagascar or Mauritius with the European Union fleet, we're giving them access to our exclusive economic zone to come and access the fish production sites where the fish of interest to them can be found. They actually catch the fish and then they take it away. And under the access agreement or the license, they pay us a fee, a percentage of the value of the fish from five to 15% only. Let me just respond to Bernard and then, uh, Bernard. 
Better. Okay, very good. Now, have you downloaded the larger document? Have you downloaded the larger document from WeTransfer? I sent you a link to WeTransfer. Yes or no? Yeah, please download the document there. Hello, can you hear me now? The internet is beginning to mess up. And um, okay, so if you don't understand the feed production side concept, please send me a mail. Yeah, send me a message, a chat right now if you don't understand the concept. Does everybody understand the concept? Hello. Yeah, Bernard, that's the one, the big one. It's a very, very big one. Understanding, yeah, open that one. Open it. Understanding the marine, global marine aquatic, open it. Okay, that's the notes. What, how, how about the one that you downloaded? The large one, have you got that one? Hello, Bernard. Yes, sir. I, I got that one as well. Okay, so can you open that? Because there are graphics that I want to use. Okay. I hope I hope you've got the large one. Did you manage to download it's a very, very large document? Did you manage to download that one? Yeah, this this one I'm sharing on my screen now is a large document. Oh, is that a large document? Oh, I see. Yes. I didn't realize that. Then can you just can you just flick, 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 page, page, page? Yeah. Yeah, click, click, click. Excellent. Yeah, it's all here. Click, click. All right. So, okay, let's do this first picture. What we're going to do now, is we're just going to do, go through the pictures and that's it. Okay. So go back to the first picture. Okay. So this first picture here is what's called shelf 
shelf-stable products, shelf-stable fisheries products. When you put them, can you hear me? When you, you process them and you put them in cans, or you put them in plastic, or you put them in glass, you put them in containers, uh, I'm sorry about this. My internet here is really, really mucking around. All right. Anyway, uh, can you hear me? Okay. So these are shelf. These are shelf stable products. Now, to understand how the GMA PC works, one of the important points is that one of the world leaders in in processing tuna, and this is something that we African countries should be doing is a country called Thailand. Thailand does not have a fishing fleet. China has is also a major processor. But Thailand processes tuna in particular and other products. One of the leading companies, one of the largest companies in the fishing world is called Thai Union. And I've provided towards the end of my large document a case study of Thai Union, what they own, who they are, how much money they invest every year, how many fishing vessels <coughs> they have and so on and so forth. So Thai Union is a major producer. Thai Union is a major producer of all sorts of fish, shelf stable fish products. And this is the end of the supply chain. So all the tuna and all the sardines and things that we that are caught in our waters end up in shelf stable processed products, or alternatively, they are eaten fresh or only slightly processed. Okay. All right. Next, next picture. Let's go to the next picture. Uh, okay. Let me just explain. So I had this one, this one, this one, and assigning flows and linkages. Now, this is a very, very important one. Now, so basically Thailand doesn't have a fishing plate, but it has a processing, a whole major processing industry. So what happens is that when fish is caught in an access agreement by the, by say China, or the European Union, the price that the African country like Senegal or Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire or Mauritius or Madagascar or Tanzania or Kenya, the price that we get is a proportion of the, the amount of money that a unit of fish is sold for in Thailand. So the fish is caught in, say, Cote d'Ivoire waters, and it is then taken by what's called a reefer, a refrigerated cargo vessel. It is caught by a persona. It is transshipped onto a reefer, and then it is sent to Thailand. And what the African country gets is 5% to 15% of the value when it is offloaded in Thailand. So Thailand and everybody else then takes all the rest of the value for themselves. Do you get it? Yes, sir. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, actually, let me just make a point. Let me just make a point now about the Pacific stuff, because I think this is a good point to, to tidy it up. So basically, the Pacific countries, the small island Pacific countries produce tuna. Okay. That's their, their main livelihood, right? So they spend a lot of work, time and work trying to understand tuna all the time. And this understanding that it is very clear that I have, I have it because I used to work for Foreign Fisheries Agency 
as their trade, one of their trade negotiations team with the United States and the European Union. Okay, this is why I learned all this stuff because we had to know it to be able to negotiate properly. And our officials don't know this stuff. And it's not rocket science. The information is available, but you know the usual African laziness. We want to eat and have fun and dance and, you know, uh, what, what's, what's that latest song? You want to play with the big boys? Uh, is that, uh, Kitty Kitty Kata Kata? That one. Uh -huh. We like that one, but we don't want to do any work. Anyway, so back to the, this, this chart. Is, it, is there any way that you can make it just one page, the chart? It's two pages at the moment. Can you make one page? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Now, okay. So, yep, that's it. So let me just uh, bring it down a bit. So, so this chart is very good because it explains everything. Now, the only change, I should have had this chart redrawn, and I, I will in later versions of this document, Flow of goods, <coughs> monetary flow, and environmental flow, okay? <coughs> now, the top is the marine environment, the sea. Fishing fleets. So what fishing fleets do is they basically impose pressure through the fishing gear and the detection devices and so on on the marine environment and the fish stocks. They catch the fish and the fish then becomes a flow of goods. So there's a flow of goods from the marine environment and the fish stocks to the fishing fleets. Is that clear to everybody? Yes? Can you say that again, sir? I'm saying yes, that yes, yes, it is the fishing fleets put environmental pressure on the marine environment and fish stocks through the fish gear, the, <coughs> the detection devices, and the fishing vessel itself. In the process, they generate a flow of goods, fish. Do you see the line? Flow of goods, yeah? Everybody got that? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Okay. So you can see that in this chart, we are doing the sustainability bit now. In this chart, mm -hmm. in this chart that you have in front of you, the dash, 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 dash line, the environmental line, that is what is showing the environmental impact. Yeah. So if we need to, if we want to do sustainability, we have to change all sorts of things to do with that dot, 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 dot line that you see. Yes, that one, the arrow. Thank you very much for the arrow. Can you go to the floor of goods? Please go to the floor of goods. So the floor of goods is, the floor of goods is, to, the, is to the left on the chart. Uh, we lost the chart again. Okay, yeah? Now, the change that when you, when you get your document, you need to change the monetary flow arrow. You need to change the monetary flow arrow and make it two-sided. So the arrow has to be both, there has to be an arrow at both ends because money is flowing in all directions, not just in one direction, okay? Are you following me? Yes. The chart is very good, but you need to you need to add on another arrow so the monetary flow is in all directions. So when the fishing fleet catches the fish, the flow of goods go to goes to primary markets. Thailand is a primary market, but it is also a processing center. Do you see how they have captured both together? The fleets go 
and offload to the primary market. And Thailand has made itself a master of the world by combining both the primary market and the processing market. So also China, so also Japan, the European Union, but not Africa, apart from South Africa and Namibia. Are you with me on this? And even yes. where the primary market is combined with the processing, the company is owned by foreign interests. Yeah? Seychelles has a very big tuna factory. It is owned by Thai Union. All right. So the chart, I think, is pretty clear if you look at it closely. Goods go from the primary markets into international trade, and that is fresh goods, fresh tuna, tuna which has not been processed. And then goods go from, they go from the, they go from the primary markets and the processing into international trade. Substitute producers is important as I, substitute producers is important. Can you, can you hear me? Substitute producers is important, as I explained, because you can substitute meat for fish and so on and so forth. All right, so this is a very good, a very useful chart if you study it and you understand it. And if you make the arrows, all the arrows should be double-sided, not just one-way flows, okay? All right, please, can we go on to the next chart? Next image. Are you all following? Yes, uh, okay, that's good. Excellent. Please, next chart. Okay, so you can see there's all sorts of detailed information which you can look at here. Yeah? I did this study for FAO. Okay, so please blow up this figure three and let me just, it sort of summarizes. Ah, very good. Blow up. All right. Uh, we'll have to stop soon now um okay figure three can you just blow figure three up so this is where access agreements fit in go on blow 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 one more or two more okay so we've got large marine ecosystems we've got exclusive economic zones and we've got fish products processing sites. So when a country, when the European Union signs an access agreement with Senegal, it is seeking access to an EEZ and the fish production sites within the EEZ. The EEZ and the FPS are located within a larger unit called the Large Marine Ecosystem. Okay? So the access e agreement is the legal instrument or the license is the legal production instrument which gives you access to the fish production site so you can use detection devices, fishing gear, and the fishing vessel to produce the fish. You get title to the fish, you take it away, and the African countries get only 5 to 15%. So from there, the fish goes to tuna traders who then sell it to branded processing factories. So a branded processor is Thai Union. It's a brand, do you see? So it goes to the, the fleet sells it to the tuna traders, put them pass it on to the branded processing. And the tuna traders are important because they are the people who ensure that the product that is going to be used by the branded processing factory is of a high quality. This is very important because Thai Union doesn't want to sell you shit. Thai Union wants to sell you high quality tuna. Do you see? So the tuna traders ensure that the branded processing factories, John West and so on, they only get the, the most high quality fish product. And then it okay. is sold in the supermarket, branded retail. And then there's a lower level, which is the non-branded, yeah? Is it clear to everybody? We are just following. Okay, next one, next figure. 
I'll do one or two more. Aha, actually, this is important. Let's just do the concept of the physics production side. Let's just spend some time on that. Okay, so these are the African large African marine ecosystems. And it is within it is within these that the exclusive economic zones are to be found. And it is within these large LMEs that you find the fisheries production sites within the EEZ. Okay, next picture. Okay, all right. So the next set of pictures. So what has happened in in the in the Pacific Islands is because they want to know what their tuna fleets are doing, because they are very, very serious about knowing what the foreign fleets are up to, every single island state has a map which shows all the areas of very high concentration of fishing. So this gives you for the ease of Kiribati, the place where the Japanese, the Koreans, and the Taiwanese and the United States concentrate every year to fish. Ghana doesn't know, we don't know, Senegal doesn't know, Mauritius doesn't know, Mauritania doesn't know, you get me? Yeah, 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 please. Yeah, okay, next one. So, this is for the Solomon Islands. So this is marine spatial planning. I'm sure you heard about marine spatial planning. So this is marine spatial planning information. So you can see tuna FPS and hotspots of the Solomons is completely all over the place. So the Solomon Islands is in a position to charge a lot of money for access to its zone. Because if you are following tuna, you can't get into the Solomon Island zone. You won't be getting your full access to the, all the FPS for tuna. Do you get this? All right, just stay on this picture. Just stay on this picture. Let me explain something which we Africans are missing. So basically, the way that we do our access agreements calculations, after the fish is landed in Thailand, then we get a proportion of the value. The Pacific Islanders have stopped doing this. What they do now is they sell, they sell access rights, the Solomon Islands every year, every year, actually every three months or even sometimes every month, they sell access to their fishing zone and they sell it, they sell that access through selling vessel days. Do you see? Because when the fishing vessel comes to fish, they actually do their accounting on the basis of how many days they spent searching for fish in your zone, how many days they spent catching fish in your zone, how many days they spent transshipping fish in your zone or on the high seas, which is the blue area on the map in front of you. So the actual accounting unit that fishing vessels and their owners use is the fishing vessel day. And the Pacific Islanders discovered this by accident when somebody looked at some Japanese documents very closely and thought, oh shit, we should be charging these people vessel fishing days because they do all their accounting, how much fuel they have spent in a day, how much the crew is paid by day. Do you get me? So we are using the wrong accounting unit. They are using the right accounting unit and they've reached a stage where they constantly auction the vessel days and the fishing fleets are prepared to pay as much as $12,000 for a vessel day, it ends up in some huge amount in millions of dollars for these small countries. And I was part of the wow. team. Which, yeah, I know. Uh, but this work didn't happen overnight. It happened over something like 12 to 15 years. And I was one of the people, well, we'll correct that, uh, Madame Linda, but we can only correct that through knowledge. And we can only correct that if we stop praying, yes? You know where I'm coming with this, following all sorts of priests who lead us nowhere. All right. So for you Christians out there, this is the truth. I know it makes some of you uncomfortable, but you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> uh, Jesus shall increase 
the loaves and the fish by doing serious work. That's what the, that's what the uh, Pacific Islanders have done. They have increased the size of the loaves and the fish to feed the hungry by working, not by praying. All right, so Solomon Islands, you can see that if you want to fish for tuna, which is highly migratory and goes through the Solomon Island zone, if you don't pass through, if you don't get a license, no, you don't actually you don't even need a license. You have to purchase vessel days, which will allow you to search for fish within the EZ. All right, next one. Next, 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 next. Okay, that's another country one. This is Fiji. You can see Fiji is not that rich in tuna. Next one. Oh, no, no, I'm wrong. Tuna, Fiji is, no, no. Ah, anyway, you can look at the charts and you get some idea of the relative. Uh, go down, next one, next figure. Go down. So the vessel day, using the vessel day app, Next chart, have you got it? You can hear me. Now next chart just gives you some idea of the different kinds of uh, gears and flakes. And it also shows you what happens with IUU fishing. You can see how the gears, the gears are matched, the vessels are matched. Somebody was wondering what trawling was. You can see it. That's a trawl, that's a deep water trawl on the brown edge. Are you all following this chart? Yes, the, gen the Jose, you're right about Cape Verde. Yes, it's less than 10%, whereas the values of the Pacific Island states are getting is around 25% and more, okay? Africa is way, way, way behind. Okay, next chart. Okay, now this one's important, very, very important. Please blow it up. Now, the fisheries production site for tuna. There are a number of activities that a person vessel I'm reading undertakes when it is producing fish. There is stopping, there's tracking, active searching, there's cruising, searching but with no sighting of tuna, and then there's fishing. And all these types of information you can actually see it on the screen of what's called VMS, Vessel Monitoring System. So if you are a good VMS person, you know the signal that you're getting when the vessel is fishing. You know the signal that you're getting when the vessel is stopping. You know how the vessel is moving when it is just moving up and down. It is tracking and following the fish. Are you with me? So you can see all this information on your VMS screen and you need to be able to interpret it and understand it. You also need to make sure that the person doesn't switch off their VMS on the first same vessel. Otherwise you don't want, you wouldn't know what they're doing. Yeah. All right, next one. Is that clear to everybody? Fishing, stopping, tracking, cruising. And it's there's a detailed me. explanation. Yeah, I don't have to go into that. Okay, next picture, 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 picture. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, so this is what shows you what the vessel is doing. Yeah? So all these tracks actually come up on the VMS. They're going backwards, doing this, following the fish. 
and this is drawn from the MS data. Okay. And this is from the Seychelles. All right, next one. <clears throat> okay, so all this is access agreement stuff. Now, okay, let's go back and let me just access agreement stuff. I think you're just, we don't have time. So you're just going to have to read that yourself. Um, let me just go, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back to go back, back up, back up. I'm not asking you to go down. I'm saying go back up where we were before. Uh -huh. Now, what I want to do is I want to look at commercial issues with FPS. There's a heading. Okay, come down, come down, come down, come down. Yeah, go slowly now, go slowly, slowly, slowly. Aha. Uh -huh. So please look at this section, economic and commercial considerations for foreign fleets. So the issues from a commercial point of view that you actually have to assess, you've gone too far, go back to pages 20, go back to page probably page 26. Page 26. So there are a number of issues that from a commercial and econo economic, aha, uh -huh, this is the one. So when the Japanese fishing fleet and the EU and those people, they want to come and fish and they want to negotiate an agreement either directly or through the, or through the EU or through the Japanese government or through the Chinese government or the one who buy a license, these are the issues they take into These are the issues they take into account, location of grounds, fuel and fuel costs, technology to be used, all that, okay? So anyway, you'll have a chance to read all of this. I can't go into all this detail. I'm gonna stop in another two or three minutes and then the rest really, you have more than enough documents. I'll actually send two more PowerPoints and that's really, because all that I do or all that I should be doing as a teacher is not telling you everything providing a guide for you to research and to go deeper. Now, I promise that for, I don't know whether there are any people who want stuff in. Uh, the, the gentleman, Jose from Cape Verde, do you read French or your English is good enough? Jose, all right, we can, anyway, those of you who want it in Portuguese, please write to Bernard and I'll see whether I can get you something in Portuguese but I'll certainly be able to get you something in French probably another week or so, yeah? I'll get somebody to, to do the translation, yeah? Okay, so, um, all right, uh, let me let me just go, let's go to the next two or three charts, and then I think, uh, mm, I think that's probably, go down, go down, go down, go down. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff on access agreements. I don't need to go into it. I've explained what an access agreement is, uh, different types of access agreements, actors, stakeholders, everything is there. Now, there's a whole section which I haven't discussed, which is for you to look at, uh, but I've actually fully analyzed the global tuna section of the GMAPC. Remember, we did all those different segments, and this article takes you step by step through everything in tuna. Okay, next chart. Okay, this one is a very useful chart because 
it gives you the stages of production yeah for tuna you can follow the arrows thawing cutting cooking manual cleaning can filling sterilization you know and i mean when the raw tuna comes they have to check it to see whether there's mercury in it all that so everything in the production process is summarized in this in this chart okay all right next one all right now so what i've done is oh okay well this one you just have to people just have to look at it themselves there isn't time next next one Okay, you've seen the, the, yeah, we've seen this picture already. It explains the, the stable, yeah, we've seen it already. Okay, and then I've given you detail about who is who in the whole system. I've given you detail about global tuna trade flows. You can see they are very large flows from the Pacific to Japan and China, very large flows from Latin America to Europe, um, a flow from the Seychelles, to Europe from Africa, just next door to Madagascar and so on. Again, this is something to be studied. Okay, next one. Then I've given you a description of the European Union tuna market and how they get their things and so on and so forth. There's a chart there. Again, there isn't the time to go through it, but if, if this interests you, you can read it. Next one, next figure. So basically, the world is divided into the EU system, the Japan, Korea, Taiwan system, and the American system. Now, um, mm, okay, no, look, I mean, try and persuade, try and persuade Bernard and others to give me, you know, to get me to do this again properly, because there's so much material here. Next one, I mean, I have the time, I'm available, so if you are interested, we can go through this stuff in more detail. Okay, so this is the US system. Yep. Okay, next one. Ah, this is the, the Japan. Ah, uh -uh, stop. This is the Japan system. You see, the Japanese get their, the Asian fleets get their stuff from everywhere. And most of it goes to Japan, where it is high quality and it's going to be eaten raw. Where it is going to be processed, it goes to Thailand and China. Okay. So it's all here. Next one. Ah, okay. I think we'll stop after I walk through these charts. So what I've done here is to provide you with a case study of Thai Union. Okay. It's about two or three years old, but it's up to date. It gives you some idea of how a large globally operating company works. Thai Union's footprint, where the factories are, when it owns all sorts of things, where the fleets are, it's all here. And all this information is publicly available. It is in company reports, but our people never go searching for it. You understand me? They don't go searching for it. All right, next one. Yeah, so you know everything, all the, the subsidiaries, everything is there. All right, I'll stop. I'll stop at this point. I've overloaded you with information. Those of you who are interested, you can follow it up. Um, towards the end, I've tried to answer some of the questions that Linda was posing. How do we improve things? Uh, we improve things by learning from the PNA approach. We improve things by learning from the Pacific Island or the parties to the Nauru, Nauru Agreement approach. And we, are, we improve things by being serious. We are not serious people. We want our politicians to do everything for us. We want God to come down because the pastors have called him and the world will suddenly get better. It doesn't work that way. All right, so I've finished. Uh, Mr. Bernard, I hope that I've given you your, your, times, your time's worth. And I've given you enough documents for people to read. And you can give them my email and I'll answer questions if people have questions to ask. After reading, 
after reading. I'm not going to answer any questions where people have not read stuff. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Foot. Yeah. It's been a very educative session. It's been a very long one. I believe most of us know what you expect after this yeah. session. So we want to thank you very much. I um with the follow-ups, what we plan to create an alumni group for this yeah. particular training program. And so one of one of our follow-ups will be to reconvene this particular session and then delve um into the issues more deeply. Yeah, and a little bit more into all the yeah. issues. Yes, yeah. so thank you very much. I mean, realistically, realistically, if we have something which is you know two blocks of two hours, it's more than enough. Yeah. Okay, sir. Okay. So th thank you very yeah. much. I, I believe in the chat box you address a lot of the questions. Um, time is fast print, and so we'll not be able to address some of the questions here. No, 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 it's fine. Yes. If we will, we're going to do a follow up later on. We can, yes, people need okay. to read and then we can come back. Now, the other thing that's also a possibility if people are interested is that I actually train people in fisheries access negotiations. So that's something that we can, you know, we can, we can also have a discussion about, and that's really. Yeah, it's a, it's a different, it's a different thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll catch up. We'll catch up with you folks later. And congratulations also to the Gulf of Guinea people. You really work hard to really seriously assemble a very large group of people. I'm massively, massively, massively impressed. And you will hear from the African Union Fisheries Group. We're called AUI Bar. You're going to hear from us very soon because you are precisely the kinds of group that we need to get on board to make sure that African fisheries are managed properly. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. All right. Yeah. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye, sir.